Um, so, uh, so when the, when the catechism shifts from um, from the the confession of faith um, to the sacraments and then to the moral life, so think about like Christian identity, right? Like where we came from, what do we believe, um, and then sacramental life, like okay, what difference does Christ make in our lives? Um, and then the moral life is is where kind of the rubber hits the road, where you really um, begin to allow Christ to penetrate your desires, the very deepest desires you have and transform them. And in a certain respect, uh, morality kind of has a bad like connotation, right? Um, and so what I wanna do is start by um, kind of putting the onus on you guys for you guys to come up with a good definition of morality. Okay, so what is morality? So when you came here, like, okay, we're gonna learn about the Catholic moral life, where you gotta learn about a whole bunch of rules. What, what did you come here wanting to learn about? What is morality? And, and, and then we're gonna to get to the point of where we talk about why Catholic morality is different than, um, than really any other sort of present, why it's more than just ethics. Um, one, one way I've heard it talked about is like, as like a map. Um, so not necessarily a set of rules or things you can't do, but a, a guide. Um, and so if you have a proper morality or a proper map, then you can actually get where you're trying to go. Right, so, so morality as a map is a really important, right? And especially that's why the church talks about it, right? Because the church knows the destination and she also knows the map to get there, right? So important there aspect. Like mines or things that you can't see. Yeah. The map can highlight. Exactly. That's a pretty good definition. Anybody else? Okay, so kind of a working definition is morality is a relationship between a human act and the use of man's nature in fulfilling his final end. Right. Notice that it's a little awkward at first, right? Um, and it will sort of, what I want to undo first, and this is what we're going to spend a lot of time doing today, is the prejudice we have towards morality, right? Like Keegan already mentioned a little bit about seeing it as a bunch of rules um, that kind of just make life less enjoyable, right? Like, and, and then, because what, what that leads to is uh, the sort of how far can I go mentality, right? And what Jesus is proposing to us uh, like he's telling you how far you can go, like, and he's offering you freedom. He's offering you, um, you're going to thrive, right? When you let Jesus get a hold of you, um, where else would you go, right? You have the words of eternal life. Um, and so we have to get out of that, that initial uh, prejudice that we think, okay, rule, 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 how far can I go before I, I cross the line? Yes. Can you move the, the camera? I'd probably kill um, it seems like when I move it, though, it just gets in the way somewhere else. But you can change it to be just your face. I don't know if you want to see the other face. Can I change it not to be my face? Yeah, top one. Top one. There we go. Um, and then you can also move that. Okay. Um, but it's all it's all about Connor. Is Connor, is that good enough? <laughs> we good? Okay. Yeah. And then the second, so that, that quote, so God's been with us all because we have Patrick around good. I was just I was just talking about this last night. Is that actually is it because when somebody does something immoral that the act is actually bad? Like it's not in, like the act itself is is, is evil and therefore is offended by or is it actually because I mean, it's it's hard to distinguish because I don't think there's anything there's nothing good that isn't for our own good or anything evil that isn't for our own. Good. Yeah, so so this is one of the definitions of sin, right? It is something that's either contrary to reason, something that's like who ultimately is harmed by our sin. Like not God, right? Like God is infinite, right? And our relationship is hurt, but who ultimately is harmed by our sin is us, right? And so this idea um, to begin to think about sin as ultimately like self-destructive really kind of flips it over, right? And this was what Keegan was saying. He's like, look, there's pitfalls on the road in this sort of ever narrowing way. And I need someone to point out the pitfalls. And if I get off the road, I need to know how to get back on, which is really important. But always to remember that uh, that the point of morality is to to get us to our destination, right? So, um, and then the fact that 
ultimately like those things that are that are sinful uh in the grand scheme of things right are, are harmful to us is and we don't always think in those terms right we don't always think in terms of okay if i do this thing that's ultimately going to going to be harmful to me um you know even in the short term right and putting aside you know punishment and all that um so th there's a couple of things here that, that i want to talk about before we before we kind of move into morality um and that is the idea that man has a nature, right? So there's two sort of controversial uh, pieces of that definition, right? That, that man has a final end, which we're going to talk about, and that man actually has a nature, right? How many of you have ever heard, and if you don't raise your hand, you're lying, that marriage is a social construct, that gender is a social construct? That, okay. How do you combat that? But first of all, does anyone believe that? <laughs> the new guy raised his hand. <laughs> no, what, like, how do you combat that? Uh, I would say by just looking at the purpose of what marriage is for. Okay, so, so see what he did, right? He's talking about an end or a purpose, right? Which means that there has to be something underlying in us, right? So if someone says to you, like, oh, marriage is just a social construct, they really haven't answered the question. Well, then why did we construct it? Why was it, why was it even something we decided to construct? Why does nothing else construct it that way, right? And so what they're trying to do is do away with the idea of natures, right? Because if you can't, if natures don't exist or our nature is malleable, we can do whatever we want, then, uh, then people are lost, right? People are lost. And that's really like, that's the whole point of this, right? It's not to necessarily like dominate uh, like intellectually, but understand that people are lost when, when that takes, takes a hold of their thinking. Okay. All right. So there's a big, uh, Thomistic word called teleology. Okay. Rob, can I ask a question? Absolutely. So I, I think your definition kind of has space for it by referring to the final end, but like, what about, you know, I don't know, like how, we use our supernatural capabilities, or is that not really a thing in this context? You see uh, no, it's it's definitely a thing. You're just jumping the gun on me, Kevin, and making me get okay. faster than I want to go. So, so ask your question in like ten minutes, and then we we well actually I'll probably answer it. But but yeah, so we're gonna make a distinction, a really important distinction in a minute uh, that related to that. I just haven't gotten there yet. Um, okay, so so teleology. Telos, this is a big word for purpose or end, right? And so, um, so if uh, human beings, like Patrick said, have uh, if they move, if they think marriage is something that fulfills them, fulfills them, and moves them towards their final end, then there must be something unique about human beings that they do that. Okay, and so Saint Thomas says every agent of necessity acts for an end. So everyone, everyone does something with a purpose. That's all he's saying. Okay, every, there's a purpose behind everything we do. All right. Nevertheless, it must be observed that a thing tends to an end by its action or movement in two ways. Okay, so he's kind of covering the, the objection. Like, okay, he said every agent. It means everything. Like cats act for an end. Well, they don't have a free will. Um, and so he says those things, uh, those things that are possessed of reason, that's us, move themselves, uh, to an end because they have dominion over their actions to their free will, which is the faculty of will and reason, All right? So, so we decide between two things, right? And we will one and don't choose the other. That's all he's saying, okay? So all he's saying is when, wh why did you, I asked you this question, I was like, why did you come to life today about morality, right? You had a reason, right? You had a, that, that, and that's fundamentally human to have that reason, okay? Um, grab like two chairs when you come in. Um, so there's always a reason behind what you do, right? Nobody ever does anything just not for a reason, right? Um, okay, so, so why does this really matter? Why does this matter? Because if we say that things don't act for an end, act for a purpose, then nothing is intelligible. Right, nothing is intelligent. Meaning, if, for example, if the moon doesn't doesn't act toward, towards an end, can we study the moon? 
right? If a fish doesn't act towards an end, can we study fish, right? So, so there's, a, there's a predictability to everything because they only act in certain ways because of what they are, yes. I mean, it would be uh, akin to studying coin flips, right? Like, like nothing in reality would be intelligible because it could change at any point, right? So, um, so that that's a really important for, thing for us to grasp when we start to think about repercussions of like the prevailing worldview, right? That there aren't natures, which then deconstructs everything, right? But I know by that that because of what a thing is, I know what it can do and what it can't do. Maybe not perfectly, right? But I, I certainly know that a, that a cat is not gonna type out a term paper. Um, but, I, and I also know that a duck is not gonna bark at me when I walk by it, right? Because they are not the kinds of things that do those kinds of things, right? But a duck will quack and a cat will meow. Right? A cat will scratch. And so it, they do those things because of what they are. And the what they are is their nature, all right? And so they, because of their nature, they act in a certain way for certain things, all right? I don't want to like beat, literally beat the dead horse, even though that's his purpose, um, his end is for me to beat him. Um, but it's important for us to grasp this because all of us have been formed in a world where, where someone would look at, like, look at you cross-eyed if you really started think, talking about this. But the world doesn't work without it. What were you going to ask on? What you're saying is that because things have ends, intelligible ends, it implies, um, and kind of, I guess, without exception, demonstrates that if something has an end, it has a nature, which is the real, which is right what you're actually studying when you study something. You can't study it just because otherwise, like you said, you have just a, an amalgamation of molecules yeah. that may or may not act yeah. in a predictable way. Yep. Yep. All right. And, and so, I don't want to go real deep into that, but but just understand that that's where the that when someone says something like marriage is a social construct, they're really trying to deconstruct reality. Okay. Um, right. Does that make sense? At least again, we don't need to go real deep into this. All right. So what I want to do now is, is flip this and and talk about us. Okay. Talk about our final end um, and how we act. All right. I got it. Thanks. Um, all right. Uh, <laughs> hmm. uh, that's all your fault, Connor, for making me move the thing. <laughs> Voice over text is awesome. I can realize how many times I say, um. All right. So um, I, I want us to begin to think about uh, when you, uh, when you think something is good for you, what do you do first? What is the first thing you do? Yeah, like I'm looking at Elizabeth eating pizza and something in me is like being stirred. It's like, I want that pizza, right? Desire, right? Or desire. So that's like our foundational, what it means to be human, right? And so I look at that pizza and I think in some way that's good for me, right? Bigger, like, Thomistic language in some way that's perfective of me. I think I will be better off with that than I will will be without it. Okay. And there, there. Go ahead, Keith. Is the like subject to be there for like it's good for you, or do you just think it's good in general? Yeah, so we're gonna get to that, right? We're gonna get to that in a second. Um, the subject subjectivity does matter in a certain respect, but it's not primary. Um, so so I perceive something as good. And immediately I desire it, right? And then um, when I actually get it, something happens, right? My desire rests. I have the pizza, it was good. But now I desire something else, right? And maybe it's to take a nap, right? Or another slice of pizza. Or who eats pizza without a beer or ice cream afterwards, right? If you're gonna spurge, you're gonna spurge totally, right? And so my desire moves me towards something else. Right? Again, something that I think is perfective of me, right? That thing, that thing that I think is perfective of me, we call the good. Somehow it's good for me. I perceive it to be good. And so I move towards it in, in order to possess it. Okay. Now we haven't gotten to the question of whether it is really good for me yet. 
but that's what motivates all of our like desire is what motivates us right it's like the motor that's like the ignition switch that moves us towards something that we perceive as good yes so you can desire something at least in two ways you can have a desire in terms of like the pizza again you can say oh i'm hungry i want pizza you could also say but you wouldn't desire pizza in the same way you can like look at a salad and you know, intellectually say well that is good for me maybe or, maybe right well it depends on your your level of temperance yeah. right so so it, this is just like base desire not not complicating it yet to go hey like now the intellect will ask the question is it really good for me i'm just saying it just on a level of desire right um so when we say that something is good what we really mean is i desire it okay and the way we're made is that we always move towards we always desire something that we perceive as some as good for us okay we cannot move towards something we perceive as evil for us. Right? So in, in a certain respect, that movement towards the good is the object of our will. The good is the object of our will. It's the thing that we're aiming at when we will something, right? And the, you guys have heard my example before about you cannot will evil for it in itself, right? And the example is always suicide, right? Someone would say, well, that's evil in and of itself know what the person isn't willing to, they're not willing to commit suicide, they're willing to have their pain eased, or they're willing to, so that they've perceived some good in the act of suicide, and they're desiring that thing, okay? All right, and so now, are all of our desires move towards something we perceive as good, all right? And so St. Thomas says, everything desires its own perfection. It's written into the laws of the universe that everything is that way, all right? You could not, we can sit here all day, we can never come up with an example of something that doesn't uh, desire its own perfection, something that God has made. He's moved everything for it. Everything is moved towards its own perfection. A man desires for his ultimate end, that's what, that which he desires as his perfect and crowning good. All right, so this is really important. All right, so my desires are for things that I perceive as good. But each time I, I move towards something, I find, one, that my desire is never fully satisfied. Right? So the minute I, I get that pizza, I now desire something else. Okay, I can, I, there is nothing in this world that, uh, that I can rest in, okay? And yet that desire persists. That same desire persists no matter what. And in fact, we all have some kind of longing for something that we can't quite name, right? And this is one of C.S. Lewis's arguments for, for God. He says, okay, every desire has something matched except the one desire that we, we can't name, right? And so he, he says that that thing is God, right? That thing is the good, right? That in which all goods reside, all right? Bro, um, but yes. Can, can't we come close, like, with the Eucharist? I mean, it's not the same thing as heaven, but, like, see what I mean? Uh, well, so the Eucharist, uh, yes and no, because the Eucharist, you does you it's meant to be a foretaste, right? And most of the saints will say that the Eucharist actually makes them hungrier for God, right? In a certain respect, because you've had this moment, momentary uh, experience of, of full communion with God and it's gone. And so it increases your hunger rather than, than, than letting you rest in it. But that is certainly why it's, um, you know, sacramentally why it's food for the journey, right? Like even like looking at the, the gospels for the last few weeks, right? Like what was the whole purpose of tying it to the manna, right? Like in the, in the exodus of life, in the desert of life, God gives us food, which is himself to keep us going, okay? So yes, in a certain respect, that's a supernatural thing, but there's nothing natural in the world that satisfies our desires, okay? Um, and so we desire many things, but that desire never ceases, okay? We, we can't faint, find uh, a desire. But yet, there's one thing that seems to be something we all desire. Okay. If I asked you, why do you eat? Why do you eat? Somebody just tell me why you eat. To sustain why? Because why? Okay. But why do you need to feel full? Okay. Have energy for what? 
to work? Why do you work? <laughs> well, okay, well, hold on. So that's actually like, that's when things get twisted around, right? You, you, you work because all of those things are fulfillment. But in the end, the answer to the question is, why do you do that? Because I want to be happy. I want to be fulfilled, okay? Everyone wants to be fulfilled. And that's the thing that we all desire, all right? We all desire to be fulfilled, all right? Who doesn't desire to be happy? Anybody? Right, and so you orient everything in your life for that, right? And towards that, that happiness, right? Nobody goes, you know, I wanna be happy so that I can have a Porsche. No, right? So, that, so happiness is an end in itself of which every other choice you make is oriented to. Again, it's, it's written in us. It's written in our very being to act that way. Okay, so, so now we're moving a little step further. So we'd say, okay, we're made for happiness. So St. Augustus says, we all wanna live happily in the whole human race. There's no one who does not assent to this proposition even before it is fully articulated, right? And so I was trying to tease it out of you a little bit. Why do you do this? Why do you do that? Why do you... And at the, the, the bottom of everything is well, because I wanna be happy. So everyone agrees I wanna be happy. Where's the disagreement in what happiness actually consists, all right? And that's what we're gonna talk about, all right? All right, so let, let's kind of summarize where we've been, okay? So all human activity is end-oriented. We, we do something for some other purpose. I take out the trash so that it doesn't smell. I, you know, I go running so that I can clear my mind. Everything has an end to it, okay? Um, and then we said, okay, but there's a final end on that long chain of ends, okay? And it's this dominant end that governs all other things, all right? Whatever my definition of happiness is, I will orient everything else back towards that, okay? You, by your conception of happiness, you will order your entire life according to that, all right? And then what we're going to get to is that man's ultimate end, ultimate end source of happiness is God himself to be a different vision. Okay. Yes. So everything acts, every act is centered on um, all ends and there's a chain back to the final end. Or can somebody only ever at one given time have a single final end? Like are they, are they always, always pointing to, I guess are all acts always pointing to the same thing? Or are there people who kind of act, or is it possible that? No, there, I mean, certainly with nobody acts like, I mean, there are certain times where we act against that, right? Like I know that if I eat that second piece of cake, I'm gonna get a stomach ache and I'm gonna be miserable, right? But I still act that way, right? Because that's what people do in club sin, right? Like, so, is, so all things being equal. Is that, is that evidence therefore that like maybe this person is not like, act, is not actually perfectly desire happiness, what the desire is, what they really, what their real final end is, is like pleasure. And they, they think their happiness lies in pleasure and therefore they act according to that. And really you're saying like in that moment. Yes. So the happiness is still yeah. Yeah, happiness is still they, they, just, they just have chosen a different thing that their happiness consists in, which we're going to talk about in a second, okay? All right, and so if we now begin to, to point to what is the thing that makes us all happy, okay, that's what we're going to do, all right? And so we're looking for that one thing, that supreme good, that completely satisfies us, um, all right, and because... Again, that aching, that longing we have in us is crying out for this one thing that will satisfy us, right? And, and the minute we find it, we can rest in it, right? And, and even as a sneak preview, I'll let you know, it's God, right? But this is why we can rest. This is why you call it eternal rest. This is why you can still be free and, and choose nothing else but God, okay? Because that's your final end. That's what freedom is for, all right? All right, so let's look at what St. Thomas says about what's going to make us happy, all right? And he, and he picks... Uh, he picks five, All right? So the first one is, what about being rich? Right? Lots of people do things for the sake of being rich, right? Um, and St. Thomas says, no, because we never are completely happy with riches, right? No one is ever satisfied with what they have. They always want more, all right? And we always never seem to have enough of it, all right? And so um, we'll sort of flip a little bit, right? We'll talk about this a little bit. Um, when you disorient yourself so that that's your final end, that's called greed. So you've taken a natural desire, right? And that we have a natural desire to have enough material things to take care of ourselves, right? A natural desire. 
but the riches are for something else, right? If they become an end in ourselves, right, then they're greedy, then, then we have greed, right? So you'll see what happens if, if you get the end wrong, then your, your natures and your desires will get all twisted up, right? We call those vices, right? Whereas someone, going back to the example with the, the salad, right? Somebody who knows that the good, the good of bodily health is a means to, uh, to being perfected, right? To taking care of yourself, having energy, whatever you want to call it, right? So that you can get to heaven. Um, then that person has temperance. If they don't, they're gluttons, right? Okay, uh, what about honor and fame? All right, so St. Thomas says that happiness has to be something internal, okay? Something we possess ourselves, right? Honor and fame is something we receive from outside, right? And it's fleeting, right? Remember we said it had to be something final that we could rest in. Um, and so that, that somehow that controlling source of it, we never have it. And when we make it an end of itself, and that's the vice of, of vain glory or vanity, all right? What about power, okay? Power is just the capacity to do something, okay? Yes? Yeah, but the minute that Mary sought honor, she would have ceased to been. So you should desire to do things that are honorable or praiseworthy, but not for the praise, but for the fact that they are perfective or they sanctify you, however you want to word it. So the, the thing is, right, we're wired always to choose what's good. We have a desire for what's good. What happens is we get twisted up a little bit. And so at the bottom of these always is something good. We just have twisted our desires, right? And only Christ can untwist them. Um, which again, now goes towards the moral life, right? Okay, so, so power is just a capacity to do something. Um, and in a certain respect, it's a means to an end. So it can't be the final end, okay? Um, so it's just happiness is a state, power is a capacity. All right, so what about bodily health? So we're getting a little bit closer. Um, and power, by the way, when you twist that up is pride. Um, pa uh, bodily health. All right. So goods of the body are always subordinate to goods of the soul, right? Because goods of the body are always what? Fleeting, right? They're always fleeting. Whereas goods of the soul are permanent, right? You will take your, your treasure in heaven is the goods of your soul. You will take your virtues with you, right? You will not take your calf muscles. It's just, sorry. Um, all right, so so the the goods of the the goods of the body are always subordinate to the goods of the soul. How about pleasure? All right, pleasure is a hard one because when we do something good, there's always pleasure attached to it. But what happens when I make pleasure an end? It's fleeting. Again, it's gone. Right, the minute I focus solely on the pleasure, it's gone. Right, pleasure is a side effect of doing something good. Yes. Because pleasure, I mean, pleasure may, may be caused by happiness. Yeah, I mean, it should be. It, it would be, right? In the, like, without getting too much in, like, getting too much ahead. But so the person who's virtuous, right? The good actually brings them pleasure, right? Even though at first, when we, we don't have a certain level of virtue, it's hard and arduous and we don't like the way it feels. But as time goes on, as you mature, right, the fruit, the fruit of virtue is sweet. Um, so, so you should expect that, uh, for, for example, right? Did uh, you think Adam, before the fall, when he worked in the, in the garden, you think he ever got sore? Anyone think he might've gotten sore? Is there a certain amount of pleasure after you've worked of getting sore? Yeah, knowing that you worked, not debilitating, but maybe a little bit of, like, see, see it, that, that's how it works, right? Like you do the good, it's hard and arduous, and there's a certain amount of pleasure attached to it, right? So such that the pleasure of, again, like let's use Christ as a better example, right? But for the joy that was before him, he endured the cross, right? So, so there was a certain underlying pleasure in all of his sufferings, right? That made it a, a certain sweetness to it, okay? 
Um, okay, so so happiness then has to reside in the person, even if, if it's caused by something outside. Yes. This might be kind of dealing with language, but the, the, the question we start with is what makes us happy? So we said in number two, it has to, something doesn't make us happy, we are happy. It's not something we receive. Um, but then we also say it's, it's not pleasure. So it's not something that it, I guess it's not a, um, it makes sense it's not a passion, but it's not a, uh, it's like a spiritual good. I don't know, you might be about to answer, but what is the, I guess, what is the difference between like moral rectitude and happiness, or is there a difference, or is, is, that, is that happiness? Uh, if we're using happiness as like resting completely in the final end, moral rectitude as a means to it, but not necessarily the, not necessarily, you're not there yet. Um, so, um, so the point then is, okay, so what, what did we decide? Okay, so we said happiness has to be something in the soul, okay? So it's not a bodily good. It has to be something internal to us. Uh, it can't be external, but its cause can be something external, right? Its cause can be something external. Right? And so each one of these, that's why they're appealing, right? So, so the, the honor or glory you receive is externally caused and you, it, can, it can be a counterfeit for that, for that glory of God. Right. So, so, so if we now jump ahead, we can say that the Beatitudes, does anyone know what like the actual word is, by the way, that like the Greek word uh, that Jesus uses when he, he didn't actually say in Greek, but the way it's in the New Testament um, that he uses for the Beatitudes? It's happy. It's yeah. So, so there's a Greek word called eudaimonia, which means which is actually a good word because it it means good souledness. Right? Anytime you see you eu, it means good, good souledness. So the goodness is in the person's soul, right? So, so Jesus is happy the person who does these things. Right? That, that's actually translation in like writing the gospel. Like yeah. So like I think like the Dewey Reigns, I think Jesus happy. We, we talk about eudaimonia philosophy class as like that which all the philosophers yeah yeah and so so what jesus was really doing right was giving us the trail to happiness when he when he went up the mountain of the beatitudes right the beatitudes respond to the natural desire for happiness so think about that for a second right like like our fulfillment is in what jesus gave us in the beatitudes this desire is of divine origin Okay, so let's talk about this because it now goes back to, to Kevin's question. One of the um, really important things to take away, and you guys who were here last year will already know this, is that there is a difference between a natural act and a supernatural act. All right. A natural act is something that we can do under our own impetus. All right. Something that we can just naturally do. I can naturally be temperate. I can, but a supernatural act is something I can never do on my own. Faith is a supernatural act. It's God who, who gives me the power. It's God who moves me. And it's God who inspires me, even if it's me who moves. Okay, and we'll, we'll keep coming back to this over the semester. But here's the question. Can you be good without God? Can you be good without God? What degree is that comparison? I don't know. It's a, it's a vague question deliberately. Can you be good without God? I mean, you can't exist without God, right? So, yeah. So, so when I say, can you be good? So, can you be morally good? John, no, John not, you're not, messing not, this up. Not trying, Stop. Not no, no. Um, no, no, it's fine. So, can you, you know what? Like, one of the things that we do, like, you all should be able to do this and do it when I, if someone gives, throw something vague at you, ask for a definition. Like, I deliberately gave you guys something vague because you guys that have been here before, yes, define your terms. The first question is, what do you mean by good? Right. So the question, the like the distinction that needs to be made, can you be supernaturally good or just naturally good? Without God, you can be naturally good, right? Without God, you cannot be supernaturally good. Even after the fall. Even after the fall. You can you can do naturally good acts, right? Like I can I can do uh, you know, I can hold the door for someone. Uh, you know, out of an act of uh, justice and, and for the fact that it's just simply because, right? Because it's just, and that's a good act. That's a naturally good act. Supernaturally good act would be, I can hold the door 
out of a love for my neighbor because of a love for God. I could never do that without God. Right? I could never do that without God. All right. So what, why am I bringing this up? Because the answer, like, as we go through the moral life, isn't just try harder. That's part of it. But what is more important is we learn how to be docile to grace, right? That we, we be docile to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that when he moves us, we respond immediately. All right. So, so when we talk about things, and some of these things are going to be hard, right? And the, the, the answer to that is to try, for sure. But if you don't really believe that Jesus can transform your desires, you're never going to get there. If I don't go to Jesus and go, I, I'm doing this thing and I don't want to do it, but uh, I've already tried a thousand times and I can't do it. And that's when he goes, okay, thank you. Thank you for asking. Here we go. All right. Because that's what he wants, right? Like he wants to take your desires that are a little bit twisted up. He wants to untwist them, show you the desires of his heart and put them on your heart. And if you let him, he will, but you have to let him. So you have to tell him, you have to be honest and, and open in prayer and just say, like, I desire this. It's all twisted up. Help me on and help me not desire that. Okay. So everything we talk about, which will be hard, do not leave here and go, I'm never going to live up to that. Because guess what? You're not. Right? You, you, naturally, you're incapable of doing those things. All right. Um, okay. So, so the desire for happiness is rooted in the Beatitudes. The object of happiness is in the promises in the Beatitudes, right? In particular, blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. Right. That is our final, yes. So we're still, we're still using the word desire. At this point, what, is, what do we mean by desire? Are we talking about just a, like a feel a certain way and want something? Are we talking about I have an actual, I, I choose, like I recognize this thing is good, I choose uh, this. I'm just talking about it. In this case, like to use a bigger word, just be appetite. It could be, it could be, uh, you know, it could be intellectual appetite or either way. Like what we want is maybe a better, and maybe we want it intellectually and not bodily or whatever. It doesn't matter, like in a certain respect. It just complicates it. All right. So at the heart then of what we're doing, then the moral life is all about happiness. All right. So that part is, that's why we just spent so much time. Right, because what we're trying to do is fulfill our what God made us to do, and that's happiness. All right, and that's not just like big picture vocational. That's just to fulfill how I was made. Okay. All right. So that's it's kind of point one, and we're going to come back to this several times over the semester. But Catholic ethics, Catholic morality, is all about happiness. All right, and don't like don't let anyone tell you anything different. All right, that's the whole reason, and we'll come back to this in a minute with, with one of the slides. Okay, so now coming back to, to sort of summarize what we talked about so far. So a human act, all right, so morality is a relationship with a human act. So a human act is just something done with knowledge and freedom, okay? And we'll talk about next week what that means specifically. Final end is the vision of God. Um, and so then we have some acts that actually move us towards our final end and some that don't. We call the sum that move us towards the, our final end good. We call the, those that don't evil or sin, however you want to call it. All right. Um, and so the fact that man has a nature means that there are things that are objectively good for us, all of us. Okay. If they didn't have a nature, then anyone could decide what was best for them. But the fact that we have a nature that, that is immutable, can't be changed, there are things that are objectively good for all of us, right? And so the moral law then isn't just some arbitrary set of rules that God sat in heaven and thought, eh, how can I make them like slightly miserable, but not so miserable that they just give up, but it's, it's ultimately a call to happiness, okay? Um, and you'll see like the, the most virtuous people you meet are the happiest people you'll meet, right? It's just a reality, right? All right. All right. So how do we then find the standard? Like, how do we find? Yes. Aaron. No, the perfection would be when, when all of it was fixed. So in other words, you desire the broccoli instead of the, uh, the chocolate cake. Have the same TV, like they 
can feel it too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Like that's, I mean, that's the level of the heart, right? Like Christ gets in there and like, it's, it's not even like the saints that like, as you grow in sanctity, it gets like in a certain respect, easier, not harder. Right. Because all the junk that we carry around of us, we've opened up and it's now easier to, for, for us to do what is good and, and true and beautiful. Okay. Um, so I may have already said this. So original sin is what twists up our desires, okay? And I think that's obvious, but just so we're clear. And, we'll, and again, we're going to come back to that in a second. All right. What does that mean? What does this verse mean from Galatians? It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Okay, so... So how, how many of you agree with what Connor said? Say it again, Connor. Christ set us free to live in the truth, but not to be slaves to someone else. Okay. Does anyone? The, the way I I understand it, the, it seems like he's using freedom in two different ways, which is kind of confusing. But to me, it seems like Christ set us free from that which we could not free ourselves, that we would seek the freedom that we can kind of go after ourselves. Maybe that's just... Okay, what were you going to say, Penny? Uh, I was just going to say that uh, before Christ, we were sort of slaves to sin and that we didn't have sort of that freedom to remove the like the chains of sin so that once he says free, we have the ability to choose freedom. Okay, so that is absolutely part of it, right? But what, why does he then start talking about what is the yoke what is he talking about? Am I a yoke of slavery? Is it just sin or is it something else? It is sin. Is there something more to it? I think uh, he's talking about uh, concupiscence. You know, it's like, like we've been talking about our desires. They're like uh, kind of messed up. Like our so will Kevin, is... define concupiscence real quick. Um, Nancy towards sin. That, yeah. yeah. Yeah, a, a tendency, like a disordered desire, right? So Christ came to take our disordered desires and reorient them, right? And so what St. Paul is talking about here, if I were to give you the whole chapter five of Galatians, he's talking about freedom from the law. Okay, well, why do we need freedom from the law? What is free? Why do we need freedom from the law? It does, isn't the law a good thing? Why do we need freedom from the law? Yes, Ryan. Do you guys hear that? that was, I mean, that was dead on. So this is what I'm talking about your desires, right? If he reoriented, reorients your desire, do you need a law, an external law saying, don't punch Michael in the face? <laughs> that's a great example. Thank you, by the way. <laughs> uh, I don't think that's why you used it though. <laughs> I think if he was sitting over there, he still would have done it. Um, right? So you, you only, in a certain regard, right? You only need the law when your desires are twisted up and you're desiring the wrong things, right? And this is a big like contention between Catholics and Protestants, right? Where you think, okay, like Christ came to, to abolish the law, right? They'll say, they'll say things like that. And then they'll go, oh, no, no. He, he said he wasn't going to abolish the law, right? He's going to fulfill it, right? But there's, there's all different kinds of laws. What he's talking about is the, he's going to fulfill it inside of you so that the law is no longer a burden. So that I now desire the things that are actually good and perfective of me. Right? Who, who doesn't want to live like that? Where there's literally no external constraint on you from desiring what's good. And you do the good freely and and quickly and enjoy it. Like, that's what the kind of freedom that Christ is offering us. Okay, and so He's freeing us, right, from coping mechanisms. Right, you don't need when when you desire the right thing. That's what you don't need. You don't need more excuses or coping mechanisms. Right, 
And so, so how do we get from here to there is you examine yourself and you're like, okay, in what ways is like for Ryan, there's no need for her desire not to punch. Like she doesn't need a law not to punch Michael. And so, but she has places in her life where the law actually is a burden. Right? I don't know what those places are. She does. Jesus does. Right. Those are the places you need Jesus to transform. All right. So look at your own life and go, okay, where is like, the law of burden and that's the place that you got to let christ into right because the end game is freedom that's where you're going to be made free all right so let's go like a, a step further in freedom right because it's a it's a loaded word um but that's what christ is offering so now let's look at the, the sort of human phenomenon of freedom all right the catechism has about five or six paragraphs on freedom so we're going to talk about a couple of different things freedom is the power rooted in reason and will to act or not act, to do this or that, and so to perform deliberate actions on one's own responsibility. By free will, one shapes one's own life. Okay, so, so what does that tell us first? Right? Freedom is not an end, but a means. So freedom is for something, right? Not just from something, but freedom is for something. Right? And it's freedom to shape my life. What do you mean, how do you shape your life? Our actions make us into something. Right? When you uh, when you act a certain way, it actually changes who you are. Right? And we even do things like I've used this example before, right? Like somebody who perpetually lies, we call them something different, right? Like we call them a liar, right? Because they habitually lie and they've made themselves into something else, right? They've twisted themselves up. So that they're now not recognizable in one way, but recognizable in another way. And it goes the other way too, right? Like a person who always tells the truth, we call them honest, right? Because they have the virtue of honesty. And so that's, that's the first point. So human freedom is for something and it's for shaping our lives, turning us into what ultimately our eternal destiny will be. Uh, human freedom is a force for growth and maturity and truth and goodness. Okay, so, so freedom is for that. Um, it attains its perfection when directed toward God, our beatitude. So think about that for a second. Freedom is ultimately for choosing God. And so anytime that you choose God, it's the freest you will ever be. And this is why, like, Our Lady was the freest human being that ever walked the face of the earth. Right? People would say, okay, well, she couldn't sin. Right? Well, no, she was ultimately, she was free. She didn't have, she didn't, there was no clamp on her, on her freedom, right? Because sin ultimately is abuse of freedom and a loss of freedom, right? When you give yourself over to vice or to sin, you enslave yourself, like Patty was saying. Yes. People argue like, oh, God has to let us sin because he has to give us like freedom. Like, can you just like address that? Really yeah. Quick? So, so in that in that case, like you choose sin under compulsion. So, so it's some clamping down of your freedom, right? In a certain respect. Um, why God allows sin versus um, is just a consequence of like everything fitting together, like the whole world fitting together. Ultimately, He allows sin. Uh, individually so that we can be redeemed so that it awakens us in some way right like this is why a lot of times people hit rock bottom like ultimately like sin like because god would not permit a you to, to commit a sin unless it was ultimately for your good in some way right how that untwists and i mean only god can do but but so so if you if you ask the question well why does god allow you to sin um for your redemption right for your sanctification because in some respects he will use that like so the, the question always is like why do you sin in one way and not another so god has to have a hand in that some way right like why do i choose these kinds of sins and not these right well because if you go down that path you're lost if you go down this path in humility you will come for redemption and that's so that's ultimately why he does that so it's something like the redemption is greater than their yes yeah, I mean, that's the human story, right? 
if that wasn't true, there'd be no fall, right? Um, and that's the whole point. Okay, so um, there is no true freedom except in the service of what is good and just, which is kind of what Aaron just asked. The choice to disobey and do evil is an abuse of freedom and leads to the slavery of sin, right? And so that, that constant uh, sin, you're giving your freedom away, right? So think of the story of, of, the, of the Exodus, right? When they go to the, when God gives them the Ten Commandments, why does he give them to them then? Because they were grumbling, they wanted to go back to slavery, right? And he's saying, no, don't do that. Don't choose slavery. Like, and, and then what does he do? He says, well, he gives them a way out of slavery. He says, you don't do these things, you will remain free, right? Which really then changes our whole dynamic of looking at commandments, right? Well, commandments are protections for our freedom. That's really important, right? It's really important to grasp them that way. All right, um, so that freedom, and then we'll see where it ties back in in a second. So, okay, so where do we get the moral law from? We sort of already hinted at this a little bit. Um, so St. Paul says, when the Gentiles who have not the law do by nature what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. And so what does that mean? What is he hinting at, first of all, and what does that mean? Yeah, which, we, which is what we've already talked about, right? So even though they didn't have the, the Jewish law, they still could look at themselves and know what was good for them, right? And know what was perfected. In the end, yes. Into your, like, and we're going to talk about that next week. So let's talk about natural law then. So what is natural law? St. Thomas says natural law is nothing else than the rational creature's participation in the eternal law. All right, so what does that mean? Okay, so all creation is governed by divine providence, okay? And everything participates in some way in divine providence according to laws of their nature, right? So the rock falling down a hill because of gravity uh, in God's providence has some, it's, it fits some plan and it's just acting how rocks act, okay? The beaver who builds a dam, who stops up the river, who causes the, drought further down. He's just acting according to his nature within God's final plan, okay? Why he chose that river, that place, that time is part of providence, all right? And so everything participates in providence, everything according to their nature, how they act, all right? Human beings do it in a unique way. They do it according to reason and will, all right? And that's all that that is, all right? So while a beaver can't help but fulfill its nature human beings can all right and that's essentially what it's saying right? and so he can man can choose uh whether or not to fulfill his end he can also choose how to right so i can choose simple things like eating broccoli versus eating salad both might be good for me right law of freedom it's not just for freedom between good and bad, it's both, all right? So, so man, because he's rational, can choose his own end, all right? And so what we call this, um, so let's flip to the next one, okay? So, so where do we get the natural law from? All right, and some of you have seen this before, we'll go through it, and then if we need to go deeper. So we're back on a level of desire, all right? And we, somebody asked a question, and I said, there, there are some objective things we all desire, all right? And in particular, you can look at human nature and there's four of them, all right? The first is the desire to preserve your own being. All of us innately have a desire to preserve our lives, all right? And in fact, all living things have that, that innate desire, all right? Um, and so these are these, where do we get these from? Well, we just look at human nature we see them, they're self-evident, right? Once we know what a human being is, we say, okay, a human being is the type of thing that preserves its own being, all right? Second is marriage between a man and woman and bringing up of children. Again, we have an innate desire to do that thing. And it is, and because we have a desire, it's somehow perfective of us, okay? Yes, John? Are you saying that we all have a desire to do that thing, or are you saying that we all have a desire for that thing to be done? We have a desire to do that thing. Okay. Yeah. 
Now, obviously, it requires somebody else. Right, 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 right. But yes. I, I don't know. I, I guess the, there are people who don't seem to desire that, though. So what? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a consequence of original sin, right? Okay, okay. So that's just a twisting up of, and, and yeah, yeah. So, so these things aren't always necessarily obvious, right? Or I guess that's not as obvious to me as the desire to serve their own. Like yeah, well, it seems way more obvious and universal to me than that. Yeah, and you'll see they stack up like that a little bit, right? Because really, in the twisting up of our desires, as we go down further and further, they'll be, you'll, you'll look at them and go, yeah, you know, I actually know people that don't think that. Or, um, and, but that's a brokenness, not a, like, not a, like a, a data point against it, in other words. Gotcha. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, Keith. So this is, this is the way it should and used to be and naturally is, but our desires are perverted and so we don't necessarily desire. It's like someone who is suicidal, they have a, their natural desire for preserving their own being is perverted. Someone who doesn't desire a man and man, woman, their natural desire for that is perverted. Like that. Well, yeah, so, but the desire is still there, but it's twisted, right? That's the, that's the point. Not that, like that, that desire can't be stamped out. It just gets twisted in some way, mm -hmm. right? Like just as like when we get further down, right? Like the fireman who runs into a burning building, like the desire to preserve his own being, he sets that aside, like by reason, like he, we don't just always act to preserve our lives, right? Like, but what it, what we do recognize though, is that preserving life is a good, even if it's not my life, even if I'm preserving someone else's. Right, that's that's the point. Yes, Ryan. That's normalizing and not wanting children. Like women, not children, you guys don't have children. And I'd be, and we see this with all sorts of disturbing things now, where it's normalizing the abnormality. Yeah, but you find that it what it ends up happening is it's almost self-destructive, right? Yeah. Because people end up miserable, yeah, right? Like when they get what they want, when they get what they want, they're miserable, which is like another like sort of argument in favor of understanding like why it's really important not to say again the stupid thing about marriage being a social contract rather than something that we all naturally desire, even if that that desire is felt differently in all of us. Yes. None who didn't desire marriage because something in them was broken and you can't desire the supernatural before you desire the natural. That's the beginning. You say, like, once they take vows, like nuns and priests and stuff like that, that they no longer should desire marriage at all because. Uh, so, in a certain respect, yes, but in a certain respect, no. Okay. So, they can, I mean, there certainly is a gift that that would not necessarily take that desire away, but their, des their desire for. Well, I'll go ahead and, but all four of them up there and we can talk about it. the desire for the fourth thing knowing god is so strong that it stamps out all of it like all their other desires right and so that's why i was talking about this having a hierarchy is really important right because my desire to give myself to god the fourth one knowledge of truth and to, specifically about god to know god will cause me to do all kind of crazy things like be martyred or become a priest or uh forego living in society and go and be a hermit right so you will always forego sort of the, the less the lesser in the sense of it's uh, like the fourth one is uniquely human, right? It is actually uniquely human in a, like in a sanctified way. And so, um, so yeah, so that's why it will never be stamped out. It's just their desire for God sort of trumps it in a certain way that they're willing to forego it. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. 
still there, it's just being expressed. Well, and in a lot of ways, they have to see the goodness of what they're giving up, right? In order for it to be like genuine, right? To, to know what, again, like that's why it, those things are gifts. Like, you know, he who can receive it should receive it. It's a, it's a gift for that reason, right? It's because it's somehow um, giving such a strong desire for God that it, that it overtakes that, that desire for marriage and children. Yes, Keith. I think we're kind of talking about two different things here. There's a difference between not desiring number two and choosing to not act upon number two because of your desire for number two. And so if you don't desire to be married because you don't want to be dependent on someone or you don't want to share life with someone or you don't want children, that's different than I want God and I choose God above all things and he's leading me in a way in a direction away from that. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's, that, it's different. yeah, it's a little different in the sense, but also over time, right? That that stronger desire for God will in some way dampen. Like it's still like the priest who's been a priest for 30 years, like his desire to be married is not as strong as it was when, and it's not just for hormonal reasons, right? It's because he's consciously kept choosing, 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 choosing uh, his vocation. And then in a certain respect, it's not that he, he just doesn't desire it anymore. But it's, it's not because he doesn't desire it. It's because he desires the other thing. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Going in a completely different direction. So number one, I've heard of, I think I've heard of it is to preserve your being as it is. What is that? Is, is that the same thing as preserving your being or is the same thing? Is this like changes to ourselves? No, I think when you hear it said like that, it's more of you're uh, protective of your limbs, for example, right? Like you're not just like the person who is like trapped under a rock and they're like, the, the only way out of this is to cut off my leg. Like they're going to do that hesitatingly, right? Because I want to preserve their being as it is versus they're going to think of any, every other possible way to get out before they cut their leg off. I think that's what it means. Not, not in like, you know, that you want to, you want to stay exactly as you are right now. I think it would be better just to say intact, right? Um, okay, so so number two was marriage between a man and a woman and bringing up of children. Um, number three, again, very uh, countercultural, right? What what is the prevailing sort of idea about uh, men living in society? You probably learned this in your. What is the prevailing sort of ideology about society? That, well, that it, the society is a social co construct too, right? That there's a social contract. Like people are basically just the individual uh, atomized human beings who, because it's convenient, come together and I'll give up some of my rights. If you give up some of yours and we'll just live together because it's much easier rather than society being a, a natural thing, right? Um, and understanding that's really important. And we'll, we'll see why when we do the session on society. Yes. Now, is this, when this says living society, is this talking about living society as in living a, you know, a city, living a, in a culture, in a civilization, or is it talking about living in, because I guess when I, when I first heard it, I was thinking more of, you know, I'm, Yes, we have. I said like you can be done through Zoom. It says that people think, okay, you don't really need. Yeah, that's a twisting up though. So, so there are. I mean, I'll let the cat out of the way. So there are two natural societies, right? The family and the state. But every single like, and it's because that those two societies are perfected of us. A person cannot be perfected without a family, and a family can't totally perfect an individual, or or the members of the family. And so they require other families to get together with them. So they be perfective, so, and we call that group of families the state or society or whatever we want to call it. And then there's all kind of, and again, we'll talk about this later, all these kind of intermediary um, societies. All right, so, and then fourth um, is knowledge of the truth. And this, again, it's specifically human in the sense of we want to know the truth about God. We want to know the truth about our final end. We want to know what our mission is, what we're made for, where this pilgrimage all ends up. Okay. All right, so, so why did I spend so much time going through this other than the fact that you kept asking questions? Um, the reason is, is because with, from these four uh, sort of self-evident things, the entire moral law follows from them, okay? Anything 
that protects or promotes one of these four things, we would say is good. Anything that harms them, we would say is evil. All right. Yes. Where is St. Thomas get this from? Aristotle. And Aristotle says that they're they're essentially they're self-evident by just looking at human nature. He said just the way, yeah, just observing people and the way they act. Yeah. Yeah. And so you can see like these, in a certain sense, they, they're not provable, right? Because they're first principles, right? They're, self, they're self-evidence. Once you know what a human being is, you then recognize what a human being is for. And you can observe their behavior to kind of know that, right? If you were to look across the history of humanity, all, all of those things would be present in some way, even if they were twisted up sometimes. Yes? Because you would say like Aristotle defines, I think Aristotle defines man as like the rational animal. If you look at... You, know, you look at all those, you say, you're rational, you desire the truth, like you're an animal, you desire preservation of your being, you desire to be able to perpetuate the species. Um, it's rational, I guess, it probably implies in some way society. Okay, so so let's, we can play the game for just a second. So murder is wrong because why? It, yeah, it's against the, the, it's against the first one. Uh, contraception is wrong because it harms the good of marriage. Uh, lying is wrong because, so there will be overlap between all of them, right? So trust is vital for society, but so is knowledge and truth, right? And so you'll see that they, they certainly overlap, right? And so what the advantage of doing this is that you can make a natural law argument for pretty much, you just keep connecting dots to why something is wrong. Okay. How do you argue with someone that they disagree? So, uh, yeah, so I give up. Um, I mean, I had a conversation with, I mean, this has happened before. I had a conversation with someone who followed me all the way, all the way to the end and then just said, well, I don't think I believe life is a good. Well, that's a person really twist. Well, it's probably a person who's rationalizing realizes she has no other way out. But it's also a person that is so twisted up that if you know we don't if we don't i can't prove first principles so if you don't agree with that or if you're not being honest enough to agree with that then then we really can't talk about it um but you will find most people will they'll concede it right they'll concede that okay wait this is beginning to make sense yes right Show how they don't change. Exactly. Exactly. Now, the application of these things will change for sure. Yeah. Right. So but now we're on a level of like second and third principles, right, where we we now, you know, and all like civil law, and we'll talk about this later, should connect to this um, in some way. But yeah, that that would be the place to go. OK, well, first of all, like, OK, is there anything unchanging in human nature? And if someone says uh, yes, well, then they've already lost. Right. They've already lost the argument. Because the things that change are just accidental, right? The fact that you know uh, human beings don't know how to add anymore, like well, that's not a key component of human nature, right? Um, it's just it's simply a lack of an intellectual virtue uh, as a whole. But the fact that human beings have the capacity to add never has never changed. I think the, the first question always has to be, what is the purpose of marriage? Right? And, and then usually that leads to a place where somebody doesn't actually know the purpose of marriage, right? Because really like political correctness, what it does is it essentially attempts to, well, it usurps God is the word. It's just, it essentially says, this is reality. No arguments. 
Like it tries to remake reality by, you know, adding an adjective to it. Like the fact that you call it gay marriage actually is saying, wait, wait, this is a different variety and might actually be something totally different. Why do you continue? Why don't you just call it marriage? Why do you continue to call it gay marriage? Why are you making a distinction? Um, but always the, the question, always the first question they have to answer is what is it for? Um, and if it's for children, well, there you go, done. Like you can, sorry, you can't have children in that setting. Um, if it's for uh, spouses coming together, okay, what does that look like? Well, okay, well, but gay spouses come together in very different ways than, than and, and an effective way that I found talking to people, uh, just asking the question, well, how does a gay couple consummate their marriage? And they'll almost always say, well, it's different. Well, that's my point, right? <laughs> Okay. So there are obviously supernatural reasons to like all that for marriage. Natural is it bring up your children and build, like building blocks of society or those kind of things? Yeah, but remember these things are for, these things are uh, perfective of the persons too, right? So in a certain like that idea of mutual help would be part of it too, right? Like yeah, like so so it is actually like the one flesh is a sort of a natural thing, even though it's like used in a supernatural way. Like part of my my role as a husband, even on a natural level, is to help my wife be protected. Now, any questions about this? So learn that like this is really important, especially given like I've heard enough about you guys philosophy classes and um, and how it goes. But you know, like I know um, I think it may have been Dominic was telling me at a class that he took, and it was philosophy class, and they asked about marriage being a social construct. And uh, the, the head people raise their hand, who thinks it's a social contract, who thinks not, and most people raise their hand, but he would never say what the alternative was, right? He would never say, well, is marriage natural or is it a social construct? Um, and so you gotta sort of call people out on that a little bit. Yes? Is society is also natural if it doesn't change the social construct? No. They, they also yeah, it's, it's an infinite loop, right? So it's, a, again, but the, the way out of that is just simply to ask the question, well, why does society do that? Fine, if, it, if they've built marriage, why did they build it? Um, and that now goes back to the question of that, okay, well, this is something humans do that nothing else does. Well, maybe that's attached to the fact that humans are um, those types of things. Okay. All right, so catechism on natural law. The natural law present in the heart of each man and established by reason is universal in its precepts and its authority extends to all men. All right, that's really important. All right, so when when the church says something that's on a natural law level that applies to everyone, contraception is not just bad for Catholics, bad for everyone. Right? And you can make a natural law reason why that is. Abortion is not just a belief, Catholic belief. Right? You can make a natural law argument why it's wrong. Right? Um, uh, Universalist precepts and authority extends to all men, expresses the dignity of the person and determines the basis for his fundamental rights and duties. All of this is just a sort of prime the pump for stuff we'll talk about later. The natural law is immutable and permanent because human nature is immutable and permanent uh, throughout the variations of history, cannot be destroyed or removed from the heart of man. It always rises again in the life of individuals in society. So it cannot be destroyed or removed from the heart of man. Can anyone give me an example of what that looks like? failure to destroy yeah so so why do uh why do people proponents of gay marriage why do they need everyone else's approval right because interiorly in their heart something is saying to them wait this isn't this isn't a path to fulfillment so what do they need any voice that keeps telling them it's a path to fulfillment would, would the idea of these things being unable to be removed, but kind of just reoriented or perverted or distorted be kind of part of that as well? Or like, you can't get rid of them, you just can kind of trick yourself into thinking it's slightly different. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it always, it always requires rationalization in some way. Yes, Ken? So in the past, when we talked about, I think it was, I think it was when we talked about an idea in the heart, like a law being written in your heart. We, we seem to speak about in the way of it's written by virtue that you that you have this law in your heart now you no longer need some sort of external pressure to do it you just you only want to do it but here it seems to be written differently because obviously the natural law is not written on everybody's heart by virtue um, 
So yeah, because that's the last part, right? The precepts of the natural law are not perceived by everyone clearly and immediately. So when it says it's written in your heart, it's saying it's, it's written in your heart by the fact that you have, to varying degrees, those four natural desires or four natural yes. inclinations? Yes. Right, because even the, the person, like going back to the example, right, of the, where their heart keeps telling them, this isn't right, this isn't right. What are they doing? They're going out to search for the truth. They're like, my heart says this isn't true. I got to find someone who can tell me it is. Right. Yes, Ryan. Yeah, because you can't you can't erase human nature, right? And we'll talk more about the transgender thing because that's a rabbit hole that we could definitely go down. But that is yeah. Yeah, and, and even the, the language, right? Like they, they don't use the language, like they, a man doesn't become a woman, he becomes a transgender woman. Like uh, almost as a, an awareness that, you know, something in nature has, has something in nature is immutable, right? Um, okay, so, so the last part, the precepts of natural law are not perceived by everyone clearly and immediately. Like that's why you have to have conversations with people, but also uh, let's talk just real quick about why that is. I think we all sort of know. Remember I said this is sort of written on our heart, right? We have this connatural knowledge of it. It's called connatural. Um, and, but we also have another sort of competing connatural knowledge, right? And that's the knowledge of good and evil. But Benedict says, reason must be suffused with the light of God's truth. In fact, when human reason humbly allows itself to be purified by faith, it is far from weakened, rather it is strengthened to resist presumption and to reach beyond its limitation, right? And so... <laughs> And not only do we have a, on our heart uh, knowledge of the good, but we also have this distorted knowledge or original sin in which we're being brag, dragged down. And so Povetic says, well, one of the, when the invasion of grace comes, it actually opens up the path to freedom rather than um, sort of clamping it down. But he's also saying why we need revelation for things like this. Right? And so St. Thomas says, there's two reasons why we need uh, revelation. Like, the Ten Commandments, maybe putting aside the third one about the Sabbath, could all be known by human reason. You could you could look at human reason and kind of and reason yourself to them, but it take it would take a really long time and a really smart person, like you know maybe like an Aristotle or someone like that. Um, and so God, uh, because of that, still reveals those things. This fallen creature's moral truth would be known only by a few and after a long time and with a mixture of many errors. Okay, and as creatures with a supernatural end, there are certain truths which surpass human reason. Okay, so what is he talking about there? All right, so can you make a um, can you make an argument about uh, whether someone should be baptized or not using human reason? No, right. The answer is no. Why? Because it pertains to our supernatural end. But what about somebody in our culture today asking the question, should I divorce my wife? Right? Prevailing culture says, sure. She's not really worth keeping around. Go ahead, toss her out. Um, so, uh, and people will argue about that, right? Like, oh, no, no, you should always honor your commitment. Other people say, no, 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 it's okay. Um, so in those situations, what do we need? Well, we need revelation, right? We need moral truth to come from the church to say, okay, no, a divorce your wife is wrong. Don't do that. And here's why. Um, yes, Connor. You're saying we can't reason about uh, that is that you're saying you can't be reasoned about just purely like you couldn't you couldn't go just from like observations of the natural world and reach that, but you could with the light of with revelation, you could then reason about it. Yes. Yeah, it requires revelation. So in other words, I could I could get up in the morning, look in the mirror and go, um, okay, uh, you know, my life is a good, right? But I could never look in the mirror and go, yeah, looking at human nature, I should be baptized. I would never get there right, without revelation. Um, okay. Um, so this is why the church speaks, all right? Yes. 
Oh, from reason, yeah, yeah, but I'm saying like they, but there's so um, going back to what he said over time, it was like this admixture of error in it. Oh no, no, you can make a natural law argument for why marriage is indissoluble, all those things, but it's but it would take someone a long time to get there. Like if I were to try to move someone who was full on head divorce, like I'm good with divorce, to like marriage is indissoluble and permanent, that would take a long time, and then I may never get there. Right, because there'd be so many little assumptions like along the way that'd be really difficult to get them right. Um, and even you see this like a lot of young couples that are even Catholic that are getting married have a lot of trouble grasping it. Right, have a lot of trouble grasping that divorce isn't a isn't a, an option. Um, okay, so what I want to talk about, which will help us, kind of. Uh, tie up everything we talked about, and then we'll, we'll quickly go through how the church teaches on morality. Um, John Paul II said that the church proposes and imposes nothing. And a lot of people took that to mean, oh, well, you can follow what the church teaches or not. How would you defend that? And is it true, first, is it, is it true uh, that the church only proposes and doesn't impose? You could say the church, I think you definitely say the church doesn't propose, but proposes makes it sound like it's a, you know, I'm giving you, you know, I, I have one option or you can, you can take another way of life. And I think what, what you probably is trying to say by that is the church doesn't impose because the imposition is already there. The law is already there. The church just brings light to what is already present. Okay, so where is the imposition? In nature. Inside, right? Interior, right? So, so what is the church's role in that then? Right, because the church, like, which is better? Somebody doing something out of compulsion of someone doing it freely, even if it's the right thing. So, so what does the church, the church proposes in the sense that she, well, she's an expert in humanity. She says, this thing is good for human, human beings. And so, uh, so she proposes that so that it will resonate in their hearts, in our hearts. Yes, Keegan. Would the, would the, like, would the law be imposing or would the law likewise be? Well, the law, like, you mean as far as, like, exterior or interior? Ten Commandments, in whatever way JP2 means the church. Yeah, he would say that that's, that the Ten Commandments, the church proposes them so that man can come to them in freedom. What would an imposition look like? Would it look like the church taking place of the state and putting people in jail or something? Yes. Okay. Yes. Like, so in other words, the church doesn't want to, no compulsion, right? So there's no compulsion. Yes. Who is he saying this to? I don't. I mean, I've seen this quoted so many times, and people who like abuse the idea of like the primacy of conscience. Because well, as the last one, the last line, she honors the sanctuary of conscience. Sounds like I would not have expected John. I would not expect to say Pope Saint John Paul II to be in this. Yeah. We'll come back to when we talk about conscience next week. Yeah, John. How does that? How does that play out in the like state creation of law? dimension you mean like and like like it seems it seems to me like a law restricting your ability to murder people is somehow an imposition well yeah so he's talking about the church not necessarily okay. but so, yes so so uh then is it wrong for us to advocate for laws no 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 what he's saying is that the the, the way in which the church proposes the moral law or gives the moral law not how it's how it is, because um, one of the one of the roles of the state is to even under compulsion to uh, give laws. And so there is a place for imposition. Yeah, there's totally yeah yeah, yeah. not yeah the, it shouldn't come from the church is what he's saying okay. in that regard right there can be things like canon law and all that but he's just saying when it comes to the moral law like the church isn't so in other words. Um, Let's just say a Catholic couple wanted to get divorced, right? right. Now, he's not saying, okay, well, if they want to get divorced, we're going to let them. What he's saying is, is that we're not going to do anything uh, to stop them, which is different. Except tell them. Right, <laughs> except tell them. Right. So, so and, and there might be like ecclesiastical like consequences of it. Right. But what he's saying is, is that the church is not... A, about like forcing them to stay together. Like this, you know, she's, they're not gonna, you, you see this like in the Mormon church, right? Like 
uh, a lot of times they will ostracize someone, for example, or they will force them to do something, uh, force people to do something where he's saying the church is totally opposed to that. Like if, if the person, you know, in good faith decides they're going to do this thing, we're going to respect their freedom, even if it's bad for them. Okay. And we're not going to, you know, throw them into church jail or something. So excommunication, would that be for the sake of the church? Not like, and that's something like an imposition, but it's not because the person didn't say didn't do what the church wanted. It's because they're actually like a poison to the church. Well, but it's both. It's also for the person's benefit. So what he's saying is we want him to come back in freedom. But so then like, why would that be okay, but not you, if you get divorced from your ex or something like that? And uh, well, I guess, I mean, I didn't necessarily, when I was thinking more of like imposition, I didn't mean necessarily like, um, I didn't mean that. Uh, no. I think I pulled it and stretched it. Um, the, uh, yeah, so what I meant by input, like forced in some way, that's not forced because the person is still free to go, but free to come back, right? That, I, mean, I think that's the, the, the whole purpose of the excommunication is, is it's the person has to freely, because that's, again, if they're going to confess their sin, it has to be freely done, right? And so that, that she will then propose, okay, well, if you divorce, like, you have to fix that and without imposing it in some way. It's a, it's a subtle thing, but... So, so something like, I'm trying to understand the difference between, like, something that the, the state would do and something that the church would do. And there's a lot of subtleties, but, like, murder if someone or stealing we'll, we'll say someone steals or embezzles a whole lot of money if they give it back they still go to jail whereas in the church if you are heretical but then you repent you are immoral. right yeah like this so the church wouldn't put the heretic under house arrest for example right yes Yeah, the person has really already separated themselves. It's not a juridical, which is an important part too. Yeah, I mean, it's really the person has, the church is recognizing some reality that the person has already imposed on themselves. Always. Yeah, yeah, always. Always. The minute they're, I mean, the minute they're ready to repent, you know, there's not, they don't like, they can, you know, stay for, stay out forever. Okay, so let's talk about how the church teaches with the moral law. Again, these are the, the sort of um, arguments you often hear. So there is no place um, more abused, by the way, you guys may already know this, than the church is more like people will accept the creed. They'll kind of believe in the sacraments, but when it comes to the, the church's moral teachings, it's, it's been hijacked really badly. Um, and this is why it's really important to be able to grasp these things um, and then be able to explain them to other people. So these are the typical sort of arguments you'll hear, by the way. The Pope may be infallible, but unless a Pope speaks ex cathedra on a particular moral issue, we are all free to follow our own opinions and do what we want to do. Is that true? All right, is the second one true? The Pope, the Pope has never taught infallibly on moral issues. Okay, so um, so we got to kind of define our terms a little bit, right? All right, so so the Pope is can be infallible when he speaks a cathedra from the chair when he deliberately means to be uh, when he deliberately means to teach something like the Assumption of Mary, right? As a as a truth to be definitively held, but the Church is also infallible, all right? And the way the Church is infallible, one of the ways is when the church universally, not necessarily every single bishop or at a given time, believes something to be true, all right, throughout time, all right? And so certain things, the Pope doesn't need to make an ex-cathedra statement, right? Is, does the church teach, the, teach infallibly that murder is wrong? 
right? Because from day one, murder was wrong. All right? And this is where we really get into an issue of people just not understanding what infallibility means. What about the precepts of the natural law? Does the church teach that those are infallible? <laughs> All right, so, so if, if I can come to, if I can reason to something being morally wrong um, and the church has declared it uh, at some point, not declared it like infallibly, but over time has always taught that something is wrong, is that infallible? All right. How many of you ever heard that contraception is not an infallible teaching? You ever heard that? Yeah. So how about, well, I think it was Nancy Pelosi said this, abortion is not an infallible teaching. Has anyone ever heard that? Yeah, so, so the moral law, anything that can be gleaned from human reason, anything connected to the Ten Commandments, anything in scripture, all of that is part of the infallible teaching of the church. So let's see if we can get a little example here. This is just from Vatican II, um, talking about the two kinds of uh, ways in which uh, the church exercises what's called extraordinary magisterium. And that's when the Pope speaks ex cathedra. And then when the Pope in union with the bishops also um, declares something to be infallible, okay? But there's what's called the ordinary magisterium, right? And this pertains to, uh, sacred tradition, unity of the church fathers, there's many different ways in which the ordinary magisterium, right? So if the church continues to teach something over time, repeatedly, that belongs uh, and is protected by the charism of infallibility, yes? Um, is the catechism infallible as like the catechism or is it just a summary of infallible teachings that Yeah, it, it, well, it's not a summary of infallible teachings. There are infallible teachings in it, but it in and of itself is not infallible. So it's, it's the infallibility of certain teachings within the catechism. Their infallibility does not come from the catechism, but from either the extraordinary or the ordinary. Yes. So the, the power of what's in the catechism is always in the footnotes, like where, where it comes from, right? And where it, um, and I think, We've talked about this before, but this is why like footnotes are really important when you read church teaching because the, it's always a connection throughout time. Um, so, um, and things like the catechism, while helpful, they're not even part of like the ordinary magisterium for the simple reason that they change, right? Like ordinary magisterium doesn't change, right? So, so you can't, for example, um, and we'll talk more about this, when the catechism was so-called updated uh, regarding uh, the death penalty recently. That is not a change in the church's teaching. You can't change the church's teaching, first of all. You can't, and you can't change it by adding it to the catechism, right? And so the catechism is meant to be just a summary of the faith, but it is not necessarily a list of, of all the stuff the church believes, okay? Yes. So something like the liturgy, the church has the authority to change, and so that wouldn't be a change in magisterium. Are there other things similar to the liturgy that the church can change based on the times that, like, would we be like magisterium, or like doctrine? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, there are certain aspects of of doctrine that might change, right? So, um, so think about like the church's moral teachings on economics, how they apply to, and we'll talk about this when we talk about economics, but. How they apply to a given time period, a given how they applied in the 12th century versus capitalism now looks different. But then when you begin to peel back, the principles will always be the same. Similarly, yes, yeah, yeah, because there's there's a foundational element in the liturgy that can't change, right? The consecration, and then everything else built around it really is to peel back to get to the to the like for, think of it as like first principle. But yes, so says the bishops. In more union, more union, in unity with the Pope. So you can take extreme examples, the Arian heresy. You can take smaller examples of maybe there's one, you know, crazy bishop in some, or, or a group of crazy bishops in some country or something like that. What does that, I guess, what does that mean? When does it make enough to be a. Yeah, I mean, there's a little bit of question about that. The, the issue always that you'd bump, like, and now you'd bump into is tr sacred tradition also has a voice, right? Whereas, you know, the Arian heresy in the fourth century, you weren't necessarily uh, 
you weren't necessarily in it, the church didn't necessarily teach in the same way like didn't have the the understanding of the way it teaches right now um but the the point is um is that things can be definitively held even if all the bishops don't believe them or don't teach them and so like the the most recent example is john paul ii and evangelium vitae um talking about abortion he does this like four times um, notice the language, right? He says, I declare that direct abortion, that is abortion willed as an end or as a means, always constitutes a grave moral disorder, since it is the deliberate killing of an innocent human life. This doctrine is based upon a natural, natural law and upon the written word of God, is transmitted by the church's tradition and taught by the ordinary and universal magisterium. So that's an infallible statement. And notice what he's saying for all the sources, all right? So it, it is transmitted by tradition, it's in the word of God, it's part of the natural law, and it's, it's taught by the ordinary universal magisterium, right? But it can even happen in things like uh, other documents that cite other documents, right? So when you see things like always, the church has always taught the intrinsic evil of contraception, that is a very marital act intentionally rendered unfruitful. This teaching is to be held as definitive and irreformable. It's that language of definitive and irreformable is also the language of infallibility. Yes, I think that's um, it. Going back to what I guess when, when John Paul II declared, when he said, I declare, was that him speaking infallibly or was he just, I mean, he didn't need to about that issue? He didn't need to. He was just, it was just a statement, really a statement, right? That as Pope, I am saying that, you know, this can never happen and here's why. All right, any other questions? <laughs>